Father Peter Murray Murmia was born. A gust of wind that powerfully shook the world he lived in. And at the same time, a silent candle burning bravely against the storm. He was both a blazing fire full of passion for the mission of Christ. And at the same time, a calm ocean, undisturbed by life's trials and temptations. His was a life of sacrifice and selflessness, but a life always accompanied by a smile. His was a life of courage and strength one that was lived with a rare gentleness. True, the beautiful life of Father Peter Mari Murmia was a gift from God to the world at large. But in the extraordinary way in which it was lived, Father Peter Mari Murmia's life was a gift to the Heavenly Father himself. Father Mermia was the son of a peasant. At that time, the population of Savoy was mostly rural and very hardworking. As the people eked out their living by the cultivation of their land and by grazing their cattle on the mountains. In this Malieu was born on the 28th of August 1790, the one who would go on to become the founder of two religious congregations. The missionaries of St. Francis de Sales of Ancy, also known as the Frenzalians, and the Sisters of the Cross of Shivano, well known as the Holy Cross Sisters. Father Merman, being the son of a peasant, had the qualities of a peasant. Good sense, practical mind, prudent audacity, and a tenacious and calm perseverance. Father Gaydon, his first biographer, tells us that his family cultivated a big farm on the slope of the Vauch at Vouvray in the parish of Chamou in the district of Frangy. He adds, due to their wealth or due to their position, his parents were listed among the notable people of the locality. His father, Franzoa Mermia, belonged to a race of landowners and a family of good standing. He married Antoinette Pastian, whose family was known to have in its ancestry canons and eminent religious men and lawyers of illustrious memory. Mrs. Mermia had the privilege of being in the boarding as a young girl at the Visitation Monastery of Ansi and there she received an excellent Salesian education. She remained an open and intelligent country girl. Her marriage with Franzua Mermia, a big landowner, did not surprise anyone. She took over the management of her household 
and gave herself up to the humblest household chores all the while caring for the education of her children one day father mamma said i repent for not having written anything about my mother my god how much i owe her no no she was not an ordinary woman a founder owed to his mother his fine and alert mind his social sense and above all his first initiation into faith and sound piety god had the first place in the home of the mermiers when peter mermier was growing up the reign of terror of 1793 had just burst over savoy his infant eyes saw the closing of the church and the school of shomo the belfry pulled down the bells destroyed and the presbytery deserted the vision was registered in his mind in the evenings he heard his parents and other people speak in a whisper about the events which devastated the country about priests arrested and sent to prison and to penal servitude his memory registered all this soul was filled with fear which could be calmed only by the tenderness of a mother with the fuller awakening of his reason peter mermier's intelligence was enlightened which really made an impression on his spirit and his heart indeed the faith of his mother and her love for god were the two sources of her zeal towards the service of her family and religion this accomplished christian far from allowing herself to be overcome by the trials and misfortunes of her time made the house of the mermiers a shelter for the faithful priests hunted down by the missionaries she received them with cordial respect the children saw her comforting them sheltering them watching over their safety under her roof and providing them with provisions for their departure and when on sundays a priest celebrated holy mass in the house peter mermier used to remain close to his mother he felt so happy to see her pray receive holy communion and procure the same happiness to the personnel of her household and for the trustworthy persons of the neighborhood his soul was filled with it in case of alarm the celebrant could easily disappear into a secret nook and gain the forest and the hills by an exit in truth mrs mermier was not an ordinary woman she had opened a school in her house and she was the teacher around her table she had gathered with her own the children of the neighborhood and she taught them reading writing arithmetic and above all the catechism she explained to them how faith shows the invisible hand of god who sends them trials plagues and persecutions while on earth to purify the good to punish the wicked 
to call back those who forget him in prosperity and to reawaken in all a confidence in his divine goodness she made her little students pray for the persecuted priests for the freedom of the church and for return of peace to the country she repeated to them that it is because of the sufferings and fidelity of true christians that the good god stirs up vocations in the minds of the pious children who are disposed to follow his call this seed sown with love germinated in the future harvest the words of his mother made the heart of peter mermia which was already so recollected and attentive burn with ardor they initiated into him an orientation towards the priesthood later on he would say i owe my vocation to the holiness of my mother in 1801 freedom was granted to the church small schools or seminaries were opened up by parish priests where students lived and studied in precarious conditions mrs mermia sent peter mermia to the parochial school of villebouvre where he remained a year in 1802 Pierre was sent to the school of Solange founded by Father Marine Ducre. In 1804, local difficulties compelled Father Ducre to transfer his school to Milan, where he bought the old buildings of a former monastery of Carthusian nuns. He was a good student, not exceptionally gifted but fervent and hard working and very charitable to his companions peter mermia completed his studies at milan and entered the major seminary at chambery in 1809 he did not feel out of place but at home in the old house of the franciscan friars his superiors whom tradition presents to us as clever and accomplished masters in the knowledge of men soon recognized in him a chosen soul a soul over which god had great designs they honored him with their confidence and gave him the charge of supervision of one of the study halls he was fervent among the fervent his fervor was discreet and had its abode in his clear reason living faith love for his vocation and for the good god father gillet was his spiritual director in whom father mermia was attracted by his goodness and charm and who exerted a decisive influence over him in this man of god he earnestly contemplated the beauty and grandeur of the priesthood 30 years later he wrote in his diary on 21st september 1842 feast of saint matthew apostle i had the happiness and consolation of celebrating the sacred mysteries in the chapel of the major seminary 
of Chambéry, at the spot where the precious remains of Father Gillet and my former superior and director of the seminary rest. It is there that the God of all goodness had offered and granted me so many graces. It is there that he gave me so much wise and good masters and the most fervent and exemplary seminarist as friends. Father Mermia also admired Father Pierre Joseph Ray, a man full of zeal and talents, which served as a prelude to his success as apostle of the clergy. At the request of Father Gillett, every morning this young orator dealt with the current events for the seminarists in the form of meditation. At this time, Napoleon had kept Pope Pius VII back in Savon and at Fontainebleau. The young Levites were fired with enthusiasm and filled with love for the Vicar of Christ on hearing Father Ray speak with clarity, conviction and love for the Holy See and about the primacy of the Roman Pontiff. Such masters influenced them for their entire life. It was Father Ray who preached the retreat in preparation for the ordinations and Father Peter Mermia followed it. The long and intimate contacts of these two souls were providential. One day, the fervent seminarist would become the founder of a congregation and the fervent preacher, having become the Bishop of Ensi, would give a canonical approbation for his works. Thus everything was in the mind of God. He became a deacon on 19th February 1812. He was ordained priest at Chambery on March 21st, 1813, at the age of 22 and a half. Father Mermia's ministry as a priest is an important part of his life. His first appointment was as assistant in the parish of Maigland, where the parish priest, Father Deschak, an excellent and very zealous man, gave him a good training in the epistolate. The assistant found in his parish priest a man with an intense interior life. A man who judged men and events in the light of the Gospels. An enlightened and prudent pastor who knew how to adapt piety and zeal to the concrete realities of life. The parish priest on his part found his assistant a soul of goodwill, ardent but docile. He understood at once that God sent him a chosen auxiliary and he began to treat him as a friend and soon as a beloved son. Neither time nor distance would lessen the friendship of these two priests. The young curate worked hard. During the day he taught children at the parish school and spent parts of the night preparing his sermons and continuing his theological studies. He was an indefatigable worker who burned candles late into the night. At his departure from Maigland at the end of three years of apostolate, he left behind him the souvenir of a priest according to the heart of God who was held in respect and love. 
the bishop appointed him at Milan as professor. Father Marine Ducre had already chosen Father Mermier as he was qualified for this post as an excellent professor. Father Deschaka himself said, God wants you at Milan. In February 1816, he was appointed teacher in the diocesan college at Milan, where he had been a student. He was teaching the third and fourth standards, corresponding to standard eight and nine in India, and was also prefect of discipline of the college. The new professor, who was so well treated by his superior, set to work very simply with his students and won over their esteem and love. Among them were Francis Jacquard of Oniu, who was to endure martyrdom of 11 years in the mission of Annam in China. It was a hard work which he accepted willingly because he was a man of duty and loved his students. Father Gaydon too describes these activities with the young prefect of discipline. He combined kindness with firmness. He was loved and feared. His goodness was active. And he even sacrifices his modest salary as professor and a part of his stipends as an aid for poor parents. The professor was not just a disciplinarian, but a father amidst his children. One day in the year 1819, a point of discipline created a scene at Milan. Polika Poison from Belever, a student of philosophy, thoroughly pious and hardworking, one of those whom his superiors supported financially, forgot himself to such an extent as to go out of the enclosure of the college without permission. The rule was final. The case entailed the dismissal of the culprit. Common sense and the spirit of justice of Father Mermia was up against the flagrant disproportion between the fault and the chastisement. For a small escapade, a shattered vocation, to be sure punishment must be meted out, but not dismissal. The prefect of discipline made up his mind to plead the cause of the offender taking into account his piety, his good conduct and his vocation to the missions. Father Marine Ducre remained inflexible. The rule must be applied so as to safeguard authority. Meanwhile, Father Mermia did not consider himself beaten. The community, the masters and the students assembled for the formal dismissal of the young Voisin. Father Mermia came forward, threw himself at the feet of his superior and implored his mercy towards the condemned one, taking upon himself the responsibility of his future. Overcome by this noble gesture of humility, Father Marine Ducre forgave and the audience burst out clapping. Father Milan remained in the college with an enhanced influence. The clemency shown by the superior encircled him, as it were, with a halo. 
this cut in the scale of punishments restored the entire confidence of the pupils in their masters as for polycarp poison he followed his vocation with great fervor and set out for the missions after a stay of 10 years in china he remained at paris for more than 40 years as procurator for the missions of sutochun and as bursar of the principal house of the foreign missionaries the mistake of father mermia proved worthwhile for it highlighted the track which he had until then been tracing in fact there reigned at the college of milan a missionary atmosphere and from the moment of his arrival the former assistant of megland came under its influence he asked himself if god was not orienting him towards the missions should he remain as professor or follow the call of more apostolic activities after the death of his saintly mother on 23rd february 1819 he felt very strongly attracted towards a more complete detachment he therefore thought of becoming a jesuit for several months he went to help in the parish of samoa 10 kilometers away going there on foot every saturday and returning on sunday afternoon during his 3 and 1/2 years in milan father mermia thought of his real vocation he as first attracted to the foreign missions was still contemplating them then in 1818 longing for a deeper spiritual life and silence He thought of joining the Society of Jesus or the Capuchin Order. He had spoken of his desires for religious life to the bishop, who was not favorable and appointed him as parish priest in 1819 of a county parish, Le Chantela en Bonge. Le Chantela was a small town of 1024 inhabitants with a judge, a police post, a number of shops and eight public notaries a prosperous town but not very interested in religion father mermia started his work with great zeal he visited his parishioners prepared catechism and sermons started a parish school built a chapel in a distant village his parishioners appreciated his efforts but remained indifferent in 1821 he decided to preach a parish mission to shake the apathy of his people he invited a well-known preacher father joseph mari favre to help him the mission started on 18th november 1821 8 days was spent in preaching several sermons a day holding prayers in the church visiting families the parishioners remained indifferent few people came to church should the preachers give up no says father favre let us go and pray to god for the conversion of your people the two priests got up and went for a few days to pray and to do penance in the monastery of the carthusians lagond shatras situated in the mountains of dauphin some 35 kilometers away when they returned people came in great numbers to church 
and the mission ended with a renewed fervor for the whole parish. The happy fruits of this mission gave Father Mermia his special vocation. He would be a mission preacher in Savoy. The two preachers decided to join their efforts in this special apostolate. Father Mermia received his bishop's permission to resign from his parish. Father Favre resigned his work as a teacher and both, helped by some other priests, gave successful missions in the various parishes of Savoy. On April 27th, 1823, Canon Claude François de Thiolaz became Bishop of Annecy. The new Bishop knew and appreciated his co-villager, Father Mermia, and appointed him Spiritual Director of the Major Seminary of Annecy. Father Favre was appointed at the same time Director of the Missions of the Chambery Diocese. In October 1823, Father Mermia began his work of spiritual director at the seminary. He did his best in his new job, writing a rule of life for the seminarians, giving conferences and spiritual direction. But his heart was in the missions. He used his free time to go about preaching and yet didn't feel satisfied. Finally, he asked his bishop the permission to give all his time to the missions. The bishop granted him his desire while allowing him and his collaborators to remain in the seminary. He preached in Annecy in 1825 to 1826 and in various parishes of Savoy. The exercises of the Jubilee in Solange in 1826 were very successful. Slowly, priests joined him. Father Allard, Father Rocher in 1826, Father J.B. Revelor in 1830. Father Jack Martin and Father Philip Gaydon in 1831, Father J.P. de Cruz in 1832. Soon, Father Rocher would leave due to health reasons. Thus, in 1832, the small mission band had six members, all zealous priests. They resided in the seminary. All felt the need of a community to sustain their spiritual life and apostolate. But Father Mermia wanted more. In his memoir, he wrote, The constant and sincere wish of the missionaries has always been to be united together and to find a well-knit congregation. It is not enough to bring together a few jealous priests to preach missions. Only the usual religious vows can give to our group the indispensable cohesion. People see the missionaries as extraordinary men called to fight against the greatest disorders and remedy the greatest evils. Thus, we need well-prepared and well-tested men. In March 1832, Bishop Dithiolas died at the age of 80. The missionaries lost in him a father who had encouraged and helped their first steps. On July 2nd, 1832, a new bishop was appointed, Monsignor Pierre Joseph Ray. Father Mermier knew him 
and admired him. Monsignor Ray took charge on 2nd October. At the very first encounter, his most faithful cooperator, Father Allard, hastened to let Monsignor Ray know their desires and exposed to him their plans and eagerly solicited the favor of constituting themselves into a regular congregation. The bishop listened to them with extreme kindness, but he asked them to give him time to reflect. He had known the two missionaries for a long time and had highly appreciated their virtues and their devotedness and was aware of the great good that had been done in the diocese. This even the public voice would have confirmed. But he needed the necessary time to examine what had been done and what was still left to be done for a better administration of the diocese. The humble Father Mermia understood this and willingly accepted the wise decision of Monsignor Ray. But Father Allard did not share the same feelings. Disappointed at having to wait still longer, he did not want to remain in such a precarious situation. And declaring that he would be one with the missionary team by his vows and by his poor prayers, he withdrew. His departure was a severe trial for Father Mermia. He lost his right hand. The defection sowed discouragement among the colleagues. Already Father Revelord has withdrawn, wrote Father Gaden. Father Martin, rather disturbed, spoke about going away. Also, Father Duke Rose. There remained only a young priest with Father Mermia, who had been associated with the work of the missions only for a few months. This was Father Philip Gaden. Without exhibiting the least emotion, Father Mermia first told him, My friend, you are free. See for yourself what decision you have to take. If you leave me after 10 years of trial, I will remain all alone. But my resolution is unshakable as also my desires. I want the missions. I want it also, replied his colleague and he remained. The bishop with the missionary team under his protection, had two priests, fathers Keminal and Petit Jean, join them. The bishop had high regard for the missions and the missionaries. From then on, Father Mermia could count on the friendly support of the bishop. He did not fail to pass through the trial, which is a sign of God taking complete hold of his greatest servants. It was at Salonge that he was going to be aware of and live this trial. This parish, wrote Father Gaden, had been the tabor for the missionary ever since the Jubilee of 1826 and during the mission of 1833, it became his garden of olives. The missionaries were staying in the major seminary where they were welcome and good understanding reigned. But Father Mermia was conscious of the inconvenience of the situation and started searching for an independent house. 
There was an offer at Milan, but a sudden change as Father Ducre made the offer to Jesuits. Father Mermier said, They must increase and I must decrease. Finally, a house was offered on rent at La Roche. The parish priest gave all possible help. In June 1834, the six missionaries entered the new house at La Roche, a small town 20 kilometers from Annecy. The house had six rooms, a dining room and a library, just what they needed. For the first time, the missionaries were happy to have a house of their own. They lived as a community following the same timetable. Prayer and meditation were made in common in the library hall where they had a spiritual reading every night at 9 p.m. and a talk by the superior. They celebrated mass and prayed the divine office in the parish church which was just by the side of their house. On Sundays they attended high mass in the sanctuary but were careful not to interfere in the parish apostolate, giving help only when asked. This house was a haven where they rested in between their preaching tours. It was also a testing ground where they practiced the essentials of religious life. They found opportunities to pray and to study, to learn and to get to know one another better. Simplicity and joy were the trademarks of this small group. They took their recreation in the garden of the presbytery and at night in the dining room where they shared in simple games that brought peals of laughter. We are told that all, even Father Mermia, played marbles at times. In autumn, missions began again and the fathers would go to the parishes assigned to them. Going on foot and carrying their own luggage except in the high mountains where horses were provided for them. Father Mermia carried a red leather bag that became quite a legend. The superior prescribed to all to wear a clean and simple dress. The black sultan worn by the diocesan priests with a black mantle in the winter. The three years at La Roche were very important for the new congregation. They could give shape to their religious life and prepare the rules to be followed. They had many discussions in the community. Father Mermia had always the firm idea of founding a special congregation for the countryside village people. Some thought it would be better to join one of the existing congregations. Finally, all accepted Father Mermia's idea to start a special congregation in order to answer the needs of the Savoy people. They wrote a rule for which they found inspiration in various existing rules essentially written by Saint Vincent de Paul for the congregation he founded, the Lazarists. Hundred years later, when the 8th Superior General was doing research on customs book, it was discovered that the rules of Saint Francis de Sales were finally chosen for the rules. The one that St. Francis de Sales had written for the Visitation Sisters. On September 29th, 
1836, Bishop Ray gave this rule a provisional approval. The rule of 1836 makes it clear that the new congregation had to work in close collaboration with the diocesan clergy and invite them to share their new life. Their house would always be open to priests who wished to make a retreat, relax a few days, or share the preaching ministry for some time. Father Joseph Laveron became the seventh member of the congregation. The joyful simplicity and zeal, signs of a deep interior life, were clearly visible in their apostolate and preaching which attracted priests. Father Joseph Mabod became the next to join in 1839. Besides the three vows of religion, the first rules of 1836 imposed a vow of stability. On September 24th, 1838, after a fervent retreat, six missionaries made the vow of stability in a simple ceremony at the chapel of La Fuiti. These were Father Murmier, Jack Martin, Philip Gaden, Joseph Keminal Aim Petrigin, Joseph Laveral. Father Murmier, who presided, spoke. For 10 years, I have been devoted to the work of mission, preaching to the august services of Jesus Christ, the first missionary. I desired one thing and asked the Lord for it, that I might live with brothers. I have prayed to be able to start a society devoted to apostolate, and I see it born today. I embrace beforehand all those who later on will make the vow after me. I see that I shall have much to suffer. Well, I shall suffer. I see myself without experience, filled with defects, unable to direct a society. Yet, I am not discouraged. I count on the grace of God and your goodwill. In the meantime, the rule of 1836 had been revised. The rule of the missionaries of ANSI was replaced by the rule of the missionaries of St. Francis de Sales, which was presented to Bishop Ray on September 10, 1838. Father Murmia asked the bishop to approve the rule, making the missionaries a society of religious priests. He gave his arguments. The parish missions are growing in importance. Some parishes have funds to give the missions every 10 years, even every 7 or 5 years. The missionaries are too few to face the hard work. Within 17 years, three of them died young, Father Far, Alad and Highborn. Three others had to withdraw with the ruined health. On the material and spiritual plane, the missionaries need the support of an approved congregation. Letter of 10th September 1838 and now, St. Francis D. Sales, as the faithful imitator of Jesus Christ and of all his virtues, particularly his love for sinners and his meekness, which he practiced with such heroism. With the grace of God and the intercession of this blessed patron, the missionaries named after him will profess to imitate these virtues 
in a special manner. Constitutions of 1838 For a legal existence, the King of Sardina on the request of the Bishop, Duke of Savoy, Charles Albert, granted the approval of the government by letters dated 29th September 1838. Turin Bishop Ray received the royal documents and came himself to Lafiti on 21st October with several priests to hand it over solemnly to Father Mermia. After the superior had expressed his gratitude, the bishop addressed the missionaries, stressing their Salesian vocation. I shall express your duties in these words. Study St. Francis de Sales, imitate his virtues, take as your own his methods of direction, being gentle towards the sinners. You will discover his method in his letters. You will see the treasure of his heart in his treatise on the love of God. Read these pages burning with the most ardent charity. His gentleness seems to have been our only means to exercise his zeal. With gentleness, show a strong zeal against vice. A few days later, on 24th October, Bishop Ray granted the canonical approval, making the MSFS congregation a diocesan religious institute. During two years, Father Mermia and his confreres prepared themselves for religious life while continuing their ministry of preaching. It was a real novitiate, though not in the usual form. They studied the writing of St. Francis de Sales. They studied the main virtues of religious life, charity, humility, zeal, simplicity, renunciation of one's judgment, flowering into perfect obedience. They had plenty of opportunities of practicing them in the community life while preaching missions, as they were usually three or four together. On 24th October 1840, the bishop presided over the first perpetual vows. At 8.30 a.m. after singing the Verni Creator, the bishop told the community of his joy, spoke about religious life, about the special protection of St. Francis de Sales and St. Raphael the Archangel, whose feast was kept on the same day. Then, his Lordship celebrated Mass. At communion, five missionaries made their perpetual vows in front of the raised host and received the body of Christ. The five were Fathers Mermia, Martin, Keminal, Laveral and Petit Jean. After Mass, the ceremony ended with the tedium and the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament.